You're live on YouTube according to my screen. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, so I'm going to, to share with you the link for YouTube and then you can share it with your folks. Hello, welcome to the State of the Nation. We are live on YouTube. I know. Yes, welcome to the State of the Nation. Uh, my name is Henry Sully, and uh, this is the State of the Nation. This is the State of the Nation today. Uh, we are looking at uh, women in leadership, women in leadership and uh, we are trying to interrogate uh, the question of how men uh, can contribute to empowering women in uh, leadership. Uh, so I hope you are all excited. Today we uh, changed uh, the mode of uh, interaction basically because uh, our folks in Kampala uh, I do not have a very good uh, internet uh, infrastructure, uh, and I find that Zoom is more uh, effective to communicate uh, than StreamYard is because StreamYard is a, is a heavy uh, platform. It takes uh, too much internet, uh, which is not accorded to Ugandans at the moment. Uh, so I hope uh, you are going to enjoy this conversation, and I hope uh, you are excited to be uh, with us today uh, in the room. Uh, Today we have uh, two panelists. We are supposed to have three panelists. One of the, the other panelists who is also a candidate uh, uh, for, for good president uh, in Macquarie University. Is, 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 she's still engaging in a, a debate, presidential debate. Uh, we hope that she's going to join us uh, shortly. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to acknowledge the land on which, uh, upon which we work. Uh, because of course, without that land, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so it's always good to, to acknowledge uh, indigenous land. Uh, I hope this practice can, can be picked up uh, by our folks in Uganda one day. Uh, so we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land for the Huron Wendent, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across the Tato Island. Uh, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to serve on this land. Uh, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the studio today, we do have uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi and uh, our very own Patricia uh, Namiaro, both uh organizational community organizers uh political activists researchers writers who a lot uh, to be excited about i hope you are as excited as i am so i'm going to uh, uh, to invite uh, patricia to introduce herself uh, and uh, tell us why she's excited about this topic then uh, dr Stella will come in and join uh, the conversation as well uh, patricia Perfect. I'm Patricia Namialo. I've been working on human rights for some time, but I'm slowly going uh, into a different direction. But um, I would like to call myself an independent representative of the people, uh, both in Uganda and uh, here in the United States as a human rights uh, activist and a workers defender with uh, Unite Here Local 25, which is a union and a nonprofit organization that represents over 7,000 uh, workers. And I'm excited to uh, be here because um, here in the United States as a woman, I am someone that's uh, very respected uh, within the union that uh, I work in. But then um, when I look on the Ugandan side, I, do, I have faced uh, disrespect uh, from men. And I wonder why we are not really allowing women to um, really show off their leadership skills and al allowing them uh, space in politics and uh, why men in Uganda not really are supportive of women as they should be. So I'm happy to be here. We need to uh, talk about these issues so that we can uh, slowly start uh, putting an end to them. 
Right, right. Thank you so much uh, for, for that uh, introduction of yourself. Uh, Dr. Stella, uh, please introduce yourself. Right. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, I'm delighted to be here again, um, especially as a feminist, because we are discussing the role of men in women's leadership. Um, quite a controversial but important topic. I enter the space today as a person who's done research for many years, for, for over two decades, around the topic of women emancipation. Um, and I'm not necessarily speaking today for privileged women, because I think privileged women often will speak in terms of we are liberated, we don't need men's support. I want to speak on behalf of rural women. I want to speak on behalf of poor urban women. I did a lot of research in slums in Masaka and Kampala, districts of Uganda, and um, I have watched some of the women who contested for the local government positions in the recently uh, concluded elections, particularly women from the opposition. So again, I want to enter the space specifically positioned as an opposition member in Uganda, because the opposition is not as privileged as uh, the party in regime is. The opposition doesn't have money, the opposition doesn't have time, the opposition doesn't need to organize. So in terms of mentorship, in terms of resources, etc., etc., it's important to think of that woman who belongs in an opposition party who is not necessarily privileged. And lastly, perhaps, so I enter as a politician, I enter as an academic, I also enter as an activist. I think that we need to begin to strategize you introduced me as a community organizer, and I think that we haven't strategized well enough. Um, and I'm thinking in terms of going forward, what we can do uh, as, as, as activists um, who believe in smashing all forms of inequities. I celebrate Judith, uh, who is supposed to join us because for me, she represents another sort of woman, the younger woman entering leadership or in leadership uh, while in institutions of learning. And that is important because many times that's where we start. And so I'm excited that we have a lady representing all women uh, and running the race for us. And I, I look forward to, to, to her joining us a little later. So I'm excited. Thank you for organizing the panel. And about uh, Zoom, well, if you want Ugandans to participate until we have an overthrow of the internet regime, until we take the internet back from Yoweri Museveni, unfortunately, we cannot participate meaningfully without this sort of uh, flexibility. So I thank you again, Henry, for accommodating the slowness and impossibility of internet in Uganda right now. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. This is the state of the nation. Uh, we are discussing a conversation about leadership Women, female leadership in Uganda, what should men's role be in empowering or ensuring that girl, the girl child is supported to become uh, an effective or efficient leader uh, in Uganda? Uh, uh, and I'm gonna ask you guys to, to, take, it, to take it on uh, as, uh, as you want. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Stella, you have done some research in Masaka. Tell us about that research. What did you find out? Why, why, why do you think uh, this topic is important, specifically for underprivileged uh, women, uh, women who think that they should be supported by allies, uh, in, in which case uh, these allies are, are, are mostly men, straight men. Uh, what, what is your take on this? I want to question the straightness. You, you, that, you're last not there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Very quickly, I want to say that um, your question is important and how you ask it is important. In the advertisement that I got, um, but I think it was women, women in leadership or women leaders in Uganda, women what is the role of yes. men, yes. right? Yes. And I want to say that in terms of role, we can have a positive role as well as a negative role and that there's an entire spectrum, right? Um, people who've done research around political leadership, specifically political leadership, not cultural or economic or institutional, but political leadership tend to highlight how women are, the, the numbers of women in parliament or local government are 
dwindling. We're not going higher as the expectation as in countries such as Rwanda or South Africa, but we're going lower. And um, for me, it's, it's very curious, particularly in Uganda, where a number of people celebrate Yuri Museveni and his affirmative action. And they say he has done so much to bring women from the kitchen into uh, the front line, from the backyard into positions of leadership, right? So for me, the statistics speak for themselves. And uh, I remember asserting quite strongly that I refuse to be grateful to a regime for so-called women emancipation, women empowerment, when I don't see it, right? So the first thing I want to say is that the stats trend analysis actually shows very clearly that from the last three years, the numbers of women in parliament, in local government have gone lower. The numbers of women uh, participating in political parties is also shocking. Our women leagues, eh? women's league. So we have FDC Women's League. I think there's an, a, an NUP one, there's ANT, there's NRM Women's League. Um, on the main are dormant and mainly participate when it comes to things like Olumbe, right. burial, weddings, naming ceremonies, etc., etc. But in terms of effective leadership and decision making, our women's legs, if they're not dormant, they take the backstage or they, 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 they perform support roles, right? And so the, 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 the role of women in leadership to begin with eh, is not where it should be. Our participation, effective participation as leaders, uh, a lot can still be done. Now, in terms of why the numbers are low, I think it's because women lack support. And I'm not speaking so much only from the experience of others, but my own experience in the previous um, campaign season that we had in Uganda from around about June to January, or even now, 2021, um, it, women many times are not supported by men. That is where I want to go. But I will start by acknowledging those who supported me. As a new entrant into FDC, I was nominated for vetting by a man and a woman, right? Um, in terms of my vetting committee, I was shocked to find that although they were vetting and interviewing candidates for Kampala Woman Member of Parliament, all the people on the party were men. <laughs> and it was their task to, to ask very difficult questions at one point, I forgot that I was competing against the other candidates who are sitting with me in one row facing the panel that were facing us. And I began helping because these women, some of them wanted to cry. They were asked questions as obvious as what is the symbol of FDC? What is our logo like? But the men were not doing it in ways to show the ability of the, the, the contestants who are in their party anyway. And when women didn't know something as obvious as what is our logo, which is different to our symbol, then the men would laugh and snigger and say, how long have you been in the party? Yada, 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 yada. Rather than take it as an indictment on the men leaders who should have told us about the party, they were blaming women for not being as ready or as aware or as educated. And some of these things are difficult if you're just entering politics for the first time. Um, so that's the first thing that in terms of knowledge, Many women do not know as much as we should. We don't know the laws around election. I remember there's a lady who was contesting for Kampala, a woman member of parliament on the DP party ticket. And she traveled from the UK and came to Uganda only to realize after investing so much, her posters had gone up. Uh, some of her canvas advertisements had gone up and she realized, fuck, I'm not even registered. I don't, I'm not an eligible voter. And so in terms of knowledge, I'm not talking about rural, ignorant village bumpkins, okay? Right. But even your average woman who goes abroad to the UK and lives in the UK and speaks English like a good educated person lacks requisite knowledge sometimes to participate effectively in... Um, and leadership, right? So I'm talking about political leadership right now. And yet we find that politics has been a male dominated area where very many men have the knowledge and the skills are, and are at the forefront. In terms of mentorship and training, men tend to mentor and train other men, right? And they forget us. I mean, I was shocked when having been in FDC as a party for two years, I then became the mentor of other women. I was a fresher. I've never run any campaign. I, I was running my own campaign, which was quite difficult in its own right because I had the hugest constituency next to the nation, Uganda. 
but I was also supporting women because there were questions like, uh, how, how do we prepare for nomination? How, how do I get the commission of oh, ETC, ETC? And so lack of mentorship became a serious critical issue. And then I discovered that actually the people who are available to mentor us were men, right? And I remember in the party looking for trainers and saying to them, when are you training us? And of course there was no prepared training. And I said, but we need to be trained because there are about 30 of us women who are participating as women MP contestants in different districts who need training because we are new. In that moment, I was able to identify one to three people who are willing and available. And they were men, right? The women who are available for Kampala Women Member of Parliament, I think they were running their own races and not available to train or mentor us. I can quote, I just shared some knowledge. Um, and so while I'm very critical about the sort of mentors we need, because I don't think I can be mentored well by a man to do a woman's role, right. I think we must acknowledge the sort of terrain in which we operate, that in terms of politics, it's men who tend to be at the leadership, it's men who tend to have the resources. And so while I believe a lot in woman-to-woman -woman mentorship, sometimes it's important to also acknowledge the need to have men-to-women mentorship. So that role is important for me, mentorship, training, sharing of knowledge. Having said that, I want to say that many times the hours, the moderate, you know, uh, op mode of operation, the mode of instruction, the mode of participation is very man-centered. The hours are like 10 p.m. up to 2 a.m. when women are busy tucking in their kids to school or looking after uniforms or doing whatever. Men are sitting in conference halls or sitting in, you know, sitting rooms discussing and making alliances, right? Right. Right. Uh, late into the night. And so many times the support and mentorship that is offered requires for people to go into retreats, married women, okay, mothers, single moms like myself, there's a real challenge, right? right? And so if we're going to have mentors and trainers, it would be useful. It would be much more relevant if the sort of mentorship and training they offered was tailored to, to, to suit women in politics because not all of us have wives to take care of our children and wives to take care of our homes and wives to do all these other roles that women do to support men in leadership. Women in leadership tend not to have others, surrogates to take on their motherhood roles even when we have domestic help at home. So that's, that's kind of the third area and it, it comes from that, that we need training, we need mentorship, we lack knowledge. Men tend to have more. Women who have it are not available to us because they're running their own races. And so we tend to then fall back on what's available if we can. However, it's very much male-centered. The other problem I saw is the sexualization of man-to-woman mentorship. So cross-gender mentorships tend to be very highly sexualized, especially in political institutions, but also in institutions of higher learning where the man is the senior and the woman is the junior or the beginner going for mentorship and training and supervision. Um, these relationships tend to be bad mouthed a lot, to be highly sexualized. And I think we haven't taught our men and ourselves to manage these relationships because all human beings are sexual beings, right? I have seen mentorships fail because sex became involved. I have also seen mentorship tried to be failed by smear campaigns around, ah, why does she drive away to his house every night at 8 p.m.? Maybe they have a campaign uh, they're running and she needs to confer or consult, but also maybe they're having some sex, okay? So how do we manage the, how do we balance between the, 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 the two, sex and politics in terms of mentorship and training, it is, it is but also even association. And then exploitation is important to, to highlight because again, because men are in power, men have advantage, men have resources, women tend to need from men rather than vice versa. We have seen scenarios where women have to have sex in order to have political capital given to them from men or by men. And that exploitation uh, rarely gets uh, talked about. And, uh, and I think we have to find ways of managing it if we're going to be leaders. So that's, that's kind of my fourth area I wanted to present as in terms of introduction. So men can play important roles. I talked about resources quite a lot. Running a political campaign, participating in political leadership, 
needs resources. Sometimes status is achieved when one has resources. I told you that when women approached me to say, Stella, why don't you begin training us? Why don't you collect us and help us organize ourselves better, organize our campaigns better? We needed resources. I didn't have money. I didn't have transport. I didn't have secretary. Even just to have notebooks for 20 women is money. And so I reached out again to men in my party with a longer history who had been uh, members of parliament. And I say to them, look, I need resources to, to help other women. But right, 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 right. So uh, the internet is probably playing the game again. Uh, the internet is probably playing the game again. Uh, but uh, these are great submissions by Dr. Stella, uh, and I'm going to invite uh, uh, Namiaro to Patricia Namiaro to uh, participate as well and uh, give her submission uh, in regards to the same question. Uh, before uh, I invite you, though, uh, I know you are an organizer yourself, uh, uh, Patricia, uh, and. Uh, uh, I can see how successful you have been over the years. You are one of the uh, very first uh, advocates for people power. People power Uganda. Uh, you are one of the the, the 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 builders of people power, specifically in the diaspora. You made it popular. You made uh, you started uh, promoting uh, the people power movement uh, way before uh, some of us jumped on the. Uh, uh, on, on the wagon, and uh, you have uh, uh, you have uh, mentored uh, both men and women uh, into uh, uh, leadership. Uh, I know you have been successful in uh, creating and uh, mobilizing certain campaigns uh, in the US, uh, in the capital actually. Uh, DC, you have uh, uh, laid uh, a couple of uh, campaigns that are very uh, pertinent to the movement, uh, not just in Uganda, but also in the US. How has been your journey? Who has uh, mentored you? How have you been uh, able uh, to pretty much elevate yourself as a leader, as an organizer as well, uh, as, a, 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 as a representative of the people as you, you, you say it now? Uh, what, what are some of the things that uh, you have managed uh, to, what are some of the strategies you have used to elevate yourself as a leader? So um, luckily for me, I was a leader with Unite Here Local 25. And uh, this happens to be a very strong uh, union and organization um, in Washington, DC, Virginia and Maryland. I participated in uh, both campaigns, both the campaign to um, raise the minimum wage in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, I was the lead uh, speaker and one of the lead organizers to um, that, again, uh, participated in uh, raising the minimum wage in Virginia, which happens to be my hometown. So this was a very big um, thing for me. And then right now, as we speak, I'm also advocating uh, for the union and the workers of Virginia, Maryland and Washington, DC to further raise the minimum wage. Uh, to 15 uh, for the restaurant industry. And so um, at the time the People Power Movement started, I had already started this work. In fact, I had been doing this work since uh, 2012 when my daughter was uh, just uh, a baby. She was just born in 2012. And so I had all these years of experience in terms of leadership. And uh, at the time the People Power Movement uh, kind of like uh, became a big thing. Um, the union invited me for uh, training. And during that training, uh, we were able to um, identify the meaning of the word power, um, identify uh, that really any person has power. You know what I mean? You don't even know how powerful you, you are until you're put in a class where you are taught about what power is and where it comes from. And so um, Bobby Wine happens to be a, a mentor for me particularly, uh, seeing everything that he has done on the ground, like, uh, and him being a Ugandan and him being someone that came from the ghetto. And we've been here in the United States for however long. And uh, what impact have we made in Uganda? Not so much, right? So seeing like some, someone like Bobby Wine, someone that uh, 
kind of looked like us, uh, was a regular person at uh, one point. Uh, it really kind of um, influenced me to do more on behalf of my country. But I was able to use the training that I got from Unite Here Local 25 and uh, move it over to uh, the People Power Movement. But before I say the next thing, I appreciate Dr. Stella Nyanzi talking about her experience um, in FDC, uh, much as she's uh, a member of FDC. You know, if, if we don't start being honest about um, different things that are going on within our parties, uh, the good and the bad, it's gonna be very difficult for us to um, move on and become better. I'm not a member of NUP, but I, and I'm not a member of any party. I'll never be a member of any party, but I'm very supportive of uh, NUP more than I am uh, of the other parties, much as I support all parties in Uganda. And I can, uh, I can honestly say I belong to the People Power Movement. But again, as we know, uh, People Power is for everyone that wants to join it irrespective of our religion or our party. So with that said, I, I don't, I did not get any support. I, I can't say I did not get any support, but in the beginning of the People Power Movement, I was actually kicked out of People Power. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of annoying when you actually think about it. I, there was just some people that actually really the leaders that felt that they, they really had the, the power to kick um, a volunteer out of a movement. And so at the beginning of the People Power Movement, everything I did, I was actually working by myself. I was working by myself. I created my own group. I started mentoring um, young people on the ground. Some of these people have become uh, members of parliament. They've become councillors. They've become mayors. And uh, that's that's kind of like how I did my work, Henry, you know? And uh, at one point I got back in and then I got back out, you know what I mean? So I, a lot of people really feel like I work on the inside, but the truth of the matter is I don't. I am someone that's an independent representative of the people. Uh, people Power has so much support. Bobby Wine is a good leader uh, from my point of view. And uh, he's someone that, I support and I'll continue supporting him, you know, for as long as we continue to uh, make these improvements that uh, we need uh, for Uganda, uh, for NUP and uh, people power as a whole. But uh, I would be lying if I sit here and I tell you that I've had a good experience. I feel like um, in the beginning, they were, I, I was so excited. I'm like, wow, this is great. I've met with senators when it comes to the raising the minimum wage. I walk up Capitol Hill, I see the senators every day. And I thought that that was going to be a great opportunity for, um, for people power to, cause I'm telling them that, hey, I see these people on a regular. So if I come to these meetings and I sit with them and they see me at Capitol Hill, they're con continuously reminded of the fact that, oh, we need to do A, B, C, D and E for Uganda. Like I'm that constant reminder. But unfortunately this opportunity was not taken. You know what I mean? And uh, by the time uh, they, they felt that, okay, we want to kind of like take this opportunity, I had changed goalposts. You know what I mean? I was doing other things. You know, you, you don't just get to, um, we, we don't want to use people. You, when someone is available to do something and you can have them do, do it, take that opportunity, bring that person in. What would it have had for me to be there from the get go, given that I had the passion to do it, given that the people that were looking at me on the outside really thought that I was working directly on the inside. So around that time that Arao Mini uh, left People Power, I came back and I was working uh, alongside uh, the leadership. But then uh, eventually I left. I've, I felt that uh, I can probably do much more and I can accomplish so much on behalf of Uganda, uh, paving my own way. And that's kind of like when I, created that documentary on, uh, on Uganda. So I'm happy we're having uh, this, this conversation because um, most of the leaders are men. And uh, the truth of the matter is, yes, uh, men are playing a big role in uh, kind of like preventing women from uh, getting, like getting involved in the different things that are taking place that can elevate us. 
and uh, can push the country forward. Uh, women uh, have a lot of ideas. I know Stella Nyazi, there's lots of ideas that you have introduced to FDC and to Uganda that have been um, carried out and uh, maybe some of the ideas you introduced were probably just stolen from you. And you says like, I see this a lot in leadership. Uh, no, and I'm not talking about people power or anything. I'm talking about in general, where women uh, are used for more like ideas. But when it comes to time to sharing the, the homework, once you get away from that, you know, uh, from that space where you're bringing these ideas on the table, then all of a sudden you're not needed. And then if it fails, then you're called on again. And no, we're not puppets. <laughs> we're not here to be called on when we're needed and then when we're not needed. You know what I mean? So that kind of like work ethic um, pushes women away. But the good thing is that uh, some of us are strong enough to uh, actually create our own pockets of uh, and, and work and continue, the, continue working and continue uh, elevating other women alongside the men. But uh, Sela... Nyanzi talked about uh, the numbers of women in parliament that are going lower. And uh, the question is, what are, what are men saying about this? You know, what are they saying about this? Clearly there's men that belong to, to change, men that want Museveni to leave. But the, the truth of the matter is, if you want Museveni to get out of power, then it is very important that you're supportive of the women in power, of women in leadership, women that want to become leaders. You know, so um, men should uh, call out inequity. You know, they should not just be uh, bystanders when women's rights are being abused, when the woman is not being listened to, when uh, women are being taken advantage of, you know, and, and another thing, you talked about uh, the, the whole sexual part of it. Yeah, yes, some men see us as sex, sexual objects. And unfortunately, uh, some of us women fall for that. We fall for that. We think that, I have to do this in order for me to get this. Like uh, much as I've not uh, had that experience, but I myself, from my experience, I could have felt like, oh, I have to work alongside these leaders in order for me to be effective. But given that I'm an organizer, I already know I don't have to work with the leaders in order for me to be effective. Um, just very recently, one of the leaders told me that, oh, you, you, you left the, the chapter and so, you're not doing anything on behalf of Uganda. Basically, I'm like, hold on one second. So I can only work for Uganda if I'm working alongside you. I thought it was very disrespectful. And I know that if a strong woman like myself can be disrespected like that, then clearly there's lots of women in all parties in Uganda that are being disrespected. And uh, that has to stop. And it won't stop unless we start talking about it in dialogues like this. Right. Uh, I thank you so much for that submission. Uh, there's a lot uh, to, to pick out on and there's a lot of uh, uh, intersectionalities with, uh, uh, within your conversation and Stella's conversation. Uh, you have also talked about uh, uh, creating uh, se uh, separate pockets of influence. Uh, separate pocket, and when I say separate pockets of influence, what I understand by that is that you, you we, even though we really need, uh, ladies need uh, uh, men uh, on their way, on their journey to do a leadership journey, they don't always have uh, to feel like that's the only way they can uh, lead. They can also in their own realm, create different pockets of influence. Uh, where they can mentor each other, work with each other, uh, try to learn from each other and organize within those parallel uh, forms of leadership. Yes. Uh, uh, but I also realized that you have mentored, uh, uh, Patricia, I also realized that you have probably mentored more male leaders than female leaders. Yes. Uh, what would you say causes that kind of thing? Why, why would you end up uh, encouraging, inspiring, and uh, mentoring more male leaders than uh, picking up on uh, uh, other yeah. young leaders. Uh, to oh. go, when I look at your profile, you probably have more uh, legislators or councillors or mayors uh, who, who, who actually uh, won their elections. 
uh, and who came through your your hands initially because i know what you have done as a, 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 a as an organizer then then female why why is that why, why, how come the the, the, the male uh, uh, candidate that the the, the the male candidates that uh, uh, you have mentored have been more successful than the female candidates and why is the number of male uh, male politicians higher or bigger than that of uh, uh, females um what i'd say to that is in the very beginning of the uh, movement when i first started uh, advocating for uganda i reached out to our uh, women that i felt were um pretty strong and uh that i could work with but Unfortunately, they, they showed interest in the beginning and then afterwards they didn't show interest. So unfortunately, even with us women, we have a long way to go when it comes to our camaraderie and working together, you know, and uh, not feeling like we are a threat to one another. I don't look at any woman in Uganda as a threat to me because the truth of the matter is I call myself an independent representative. I have no party. So I'm not really trying to aspire to, uh, I'm not aspiring to run for member of parliament or anything. I'm just really trying to give back to my country. And so um, there are women that I reached out to that just kind of uh, declined and uh, they declined in such a way that they're not even calling you back to say that, um, no, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. I remember adding a very strong woman leader in a group uh, the mentorship group and uh, she just kind of exited not not even a phone call like hey you know right now I'm doing a b c d and e this is probably not the the right thing for me and then like when it comes to men they want they wanted to become members of parliament they wanted to become counselors and it's like I was giving them the knowledge I had based on the um the workshops that I had with the union and they work because they've worked for us as a union. We are a very strong union. We, we literally have the power to um, get senators elected. We have the power to get representatives elected. And I'm the person in the, in the crowd that's asking them the difficult questions and I've been placed there. Either I'm speaking on behalf or I'm placed in the crowd to um, ask them these difficult questions to see who we are going to pick. Uh, when you look at the, um, well, Washington, D.C., uh, in terms of uh, changing the House from uh, Republican to Democrat, we played a very big role in that as a union because we knew if we did not change that House from uh, Republican to Democrat, we would not actually uh, be able to raise the minimum wage. So that's what paved the way for that. But so that's the kind of work that I do. And I've been trained to do that. And right. so clearly when I was talking to these men, they could understand, they're like, hold on one second. Like the things she's saying that I need to do make sense. And they took the advice and they did what I was asking them to do. Unfortunately, the women that I gave the advice to, they kind of just wanted money. <laughs> they didn't want the advice. And I can tell you with, uh, I'll probably say I supported in terms of money, I probably supported uh, 1% of the people that I, I kind of like helped. The rest, I told them, you don't need my money. You just need to do what I'm telling you to do. Not everything requires money. So, um, so yes, so the problem here is uh, maybe looking down upon someone and thinking that, well, who's Patricia Namialo that she can help me? Because in order for me to have this high profile, I have to know Dr. Stella Nyanzi. I have to know Henry Sally. I have to know Ariel Zupago. Bobby Wine has to post me on his page. You understand what I mean? So unfortunately, some people, they don't understand that uh, the mentors are not necessarily going to come from the top. People are lucky that you, you have someone like Dr. Stella Nyanzi that's willing to come on these platforms and share her knowledge. Not everyone by, on, by, uh, like on the caliber she's at is, is willing to come and share their knowledge. And that's my submission. Uh, Dr. Stella, you talked about uh, a few things. Mentorship, for example, the lack of mentorship uh, in political parties uh, or, or organizations. Uh, and this is not just in, in politics. I think this, this is uh, on the whole spectrum of leadership, whether it is corporate leadership or political leadership or 
uh, social leadership, for, for example, or religious re leadership for that matter. Uh, uh, but you talked about the, the issue of uh, lack of mentorship of uh, those organizations. You also talked about exploitation and uh, uh, with exploitation comes a lot of things. They can exploit uh, someone uh, using so many different things, uh, including uh, blackmail. Uh, uh, but you also talked about uh, the lack of um, knowledge sometimes for female uh, leaders or asp aspirants uh, to understand the different uh, symbols or uh, uh, signs of uh, art crafts uh, that uh, make up or identify a particular party. Uh, so first, wh what is the significance of these symbols or art crafts? Uh, how do they how does how do they inter, how, how does that inter, intersect with with leadership? Does knowing all those symbols or art crafts make someone a better leader uh, because they know them, or or does leadership actually uh, just uh, exemplify that itself uh, through action, through through uh, real work? Uh, what do you think we should do about uh, mentorship? What needs to be done uh, after having heard about uh, Patricia's story? Uh, what do you think uh, we need to do? We uh, either men or women uh, need to do, specifically in the Ugandan context, uh, to produce more leaders, uh, female leaders, uh, efficient leaders. And what what must we do about uh, exploitation. But b before you answer, there's a, there's a picture that I need to, to share here. And uh, this picture is uh, basically uh, the one that is supposed to talk about the debate uh, in, uh, in Uganda. So this is the picture. Can you guys see? Are you able to see it or no? Yes, yes, Henry, we can see it. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to make sure that you see the picture. Uh, in this picture, as you can see, uh, there's only one female. The rest are guys. One, two, three, four, five, six. All guys. Even the moderators, they couldn't even think about getting a female moderator. And this is the highest level of leadership, uh, institutional leadership in terms of university uh, sector. Uh, this is Makere University. This is today's debate, uh, the official, one of the official debates uh, for the candidates. Only one female candidate uh, who, by the way, has been uh, uh, very much slandered throughout this campaign. Uh, they, they're talking about uh, his, her love life. They're talking uh, <laughs> about uh, so many petty, petty things that uh, do not correlate uh, with, with leadership. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, I need you to respond to some of the, the, the questions that are posed. Dr. Stel. Right. So thank you, Henry. We hope uh, we hope the internet carries me through. Uh, so so very quickly, they are things that Patricia said I want to respond to, but there is also stuff that you said that I need to respond to. I didn't say that women lack knowledge. I said that women lack requisite knowledge. Requisite comes from required means it's required. You cannot participate in party politics and go to a party headquarters to be vetted, to carry a party flag without knowing something as basic as, as what is our slogan or what is our symbol or what is our history, right? So there's knowledge. And there's requisite knowledge. One cannot come to the table if one doesn't have the basic training about what's needed for the table. If we sit at table and we eat with fork and knife and spoon, and you're used to eating with your hands, excuse me, <laughs> right? And so I'm saying that um, I, I, what, 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 that word requisite qualifies particular bodies of knowledge for particular forms of leadership. A woman leading mother's union must understand why they wear a gomez that's white and tie it with a blue, uh, I don't know what it's called, blue chitam, whatever, chitambara, right? Yeah. And so Henry, what I'm saying is there are women who have PhDs such as myself. Why training was important. I have got over six academic qualifications from 
cream, top cream, top notch universities, Ivy League universities in the world, from Makerere to South Africa to Amsterdam to the UK. I have knowledge, but I didn't have the requisite knowledge to run a particular sort of party primary campaign. Come on, take it there. Uh, yes, and it, it, I think in my question is that oh, how does having that requisite knowledge help someone? But it's requisite. Requisite means it's required. If mm -hmm. Judith is going to contest at Macquarie University, she must understand why the history of Macquarie University Guild presidents has been mal dominated. Why the structure of the picture you show, why the moderator and the contestants are predominantly male. There's a basic level of understanding. So requisite figures that data gisa did it require the requirements, right? And what I'm saying is that it is futile for us to require women to participate in particular forms of leadership at the chicken farm, at the hair saloon, at church, in the army, in the country, if these women do not have the required knowledge at that level for that field. Right? right, and many times, I mean, I'm not saying we have come a long way in terms of education and literacy in Uganda. Okay, we are professionals, it does not mean we have the skills to be good leaders, skills such as punctuality and timekeeping, skills such as frugality and financial accountability and transparency, getting money, spending it, receiving it, having an accountant to whom you report who is not yourself. Because that is what funders do. You must have a, a financial accounting system. And one can have a million degrees. One can be very skillful at a particular, you know, using particular gadgets, a gun or whatever, and yet lack particular important leadership skills. So anyway, so, so, so I, I'm not belittling your question around the importance of slogans, but I'm saying that in each field, where we want to lead. If I want to be a leader in music and hip hop and reggae and rock, I must understand the basics around rhythm and melody and harmony, for example, right? If it's medicine, I must understand particular things about anatomy and physiology. And all I'm saying is that many times we have women who are operating in leadership without the requisite skills to make them effective leaders. And those who have come before as leaders are men. Patricia said, Bobby Wine is a good leader. He's my mentor, right? What makes him a good leader? How many women can we look to and say, this woman X is a good leader. She's my mentor. I want her to be my mentor. Which takes me to a point that uh, Patricia mentioned that I want to kind of uh, counter the idea that women rejected, some women rejected her invitation for them to be mentored or trained by her. I have learned that mentorship is not forced mentorship is earned no right? um before you go on stella let me correct that mm. right no actually i i, I wrote it's down to, what you said yeah. word for word was to work together not to mentor no it's you can work together let me let me let me pick up on the on the whatsapp or, or the group the group meetings you are adding women to i am one of those women who is added to groups almost every week and i exit immediately Often, I don't know the agenda, I don't know the people, I don't know what I'm doing there, and I have so much time on my hands, but so many demands, and another WhatsApp group or another mentorship group for which the, their ideals don't rhyme with mine, and they haven't been explained to me. I don't think of that sort of thing. The sort of disrespect that many people do these days is to just drag us into groups. No explanation, no invitation, no what, no what, no, no even testing. Uh, synchronicity or association, do my ideals rhyme with that person? And more and more meeting ladies who say, why are you putting me in these groups? Okay, But I just want to say that um, in terms of mentorship and mentoring, when a person says I am without a political party, in a political party season, what I have observed is immediate suspicion what do you mean you want to work with us yet you're not from a political party, right? Why do you want to work with us? Are you a mole? Are you a spy? Do you want to know our strategy, our tactics? Are you selling us katwa? Katwa is poison. Are you selling us poison? And what I observed 
really, really was many times I, I was I was I was invited across parties to talk about things like how to speak on TV, etc. etc. People were receptive and warm. Parties, I was often suspicious, but unless I was going in the capacity of a professional. There's always suspicion. You're not one of us. What are you doing with us, especially in this season? And in Uganda, I think right now, especially in the opposition, I know that we are very, very, very suspicious of rescuers. People who come to rescue us out of our inefficiency, our hooliganism, our disunity, our whatever it is, whatever they've characterized us as, but they are apolitical and they are elitist. So they, they, they come with a particular skill set, which they recognize we don't have, but they're neither for us nor against us. They are there, right? The level of suspicion around so-called apolitical people, apolitical to mean without a political party, not to mean without politics. Well, for me, it was outstanding. So professionals would come and they'd want to talk about how to fundraise. And the first question would be, what party are they from? And I'd have my finance uh, campaign managers actually sending away people <laughs> simply because they are apolitical, even if they've come from the UK. The Labour Party, see that Labour Party? But, um... Right. The internet is playing us again. The internet is playing us again. The internet is playing us again. Uh, but we are still continuing having this conversation uh, about uh, women leadership in Uganda. What role should men play? Uh, what role should men play? Uh, Dr. Stella is trying to put across a suggestion that uh, uh, if you're apolitical, uh, they, they are, people are going to receive you with a lot of suspicion uh, because uh, in Uganda, you have to associate with one party or another. Uh, if you do not associate with any uh, of the parties, uh, then people are going to be suspicious of you. Uh, they think you are either spying on them or uh, you're just trying to <laughs> get uh, stuff from them. Uh, welcome back, sorry, Stella. Sorry, sorry, Henry, sorry. Welcome back. Uh, it's okay, it's not your fault. Welcome back. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Welcome back, welcome back. Uh, uh, so shall I continue or shall I let Patricia respond? Because I have to talk about um, something she said concerning movements and how she was just away from movements. Yeah, continue. Now movements, movements don't belong to anyone. Movements must never be personalized. Movements are movements. Movements belong to the masses. They belong to the people. The, the, the minute a, a movement gains a person or an office that can throw away people. It ceases to be a movement and it takes on a particular structure, right? We are the owners of the movement we belong to. It's like someone saying, someone chased me out of the feminist movement. How? <laughs> right? Or someone chased me away from the crusaders movement. How? Or the anti-abortion movement. How? It's, an, it, it's a movement, it doesn't belong to anyone. It has different phases, stages, different functions. Uh, movements are loosely organized people, groups, you know, like you, it's amorphous. I don't think movements are centralized in, in that way that anyone can chase anyone from movement. When that happens, then the conceptual definition of a movement has, of, of what that grouping is has to be revised, reconsidered. Because once a movement belongs to a person, a party, it ceases to be a movement. That is why the feminist movement is strong, particular religious movements are strong, because they don't belong. Right. Right. All right. So yeah, movements shouldn't be personalized, according to Dr. Stella. Uh, tend to agree with her, uh, movement is uh, a movement. Uh, she also uh, describes a movement as something uh, amorphous, uh, which means it has no shape, it has no uh, particular uh, kind of description pretty much. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you want to respond to that, Patricia? 
as Dr. Stella comes back to join us in one way or another. Yes, I want to respond to her first uh, assumption that uh, you, I actually was more uh, calling people on uh, to mentor them. No, uh, mentorship is something that, uh, to me, I believe is something that's uh, done by a, a group effort. It's a group effort. So if I was in a group with you and- uh, I think it could also be individuals. Uh, so I think it could also be someone coming to you and asking you for some kind of uh, guidance, uh, tips, strategies. Uh, in, this, in this particular time of uh, what she was talking about, it was more, you've already discussed with the person, I think we should do this. I'll create a group, let's get together. Let's uh, do A, B, C, D, and E. And then you put them in and then they exit, no phone call. And these are people you're kind of like working with, you know what I mean? So there should be that kind of respect and there should be that phone call to, you know, just kind of say, you know, I'm actually not interested in this. I'm, I'm actually only part of, uh, I think, I'm only part of like three groups, including yours. I don't like groups. You know what I mean? And I've exited many groups because like she said, um, they don't call you. They just put you on. I don't like that. I can't spend my whole day uh, looking at messages in groups. But anyway, so move on from that. She talked about um, that lack of trust uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, someone that doesn't belong to a political party. Uh, they kind of like sometimes look at you as a more. I've seen that too. But the truth of the matter is, I would never belong to a political party. In fact, part of the reason why I joined uh, People Power was because uh, Bobby Wine was very adamant about the fact that uh, political parties uh, divide, um, divide us. And uh, obviously he had to start the um, national unity platform uh, for, for reasons that are very understandable. But then um, I didn't jump ship once that happened, but then I also did not, move on with the national unity platform. I decided, I made a personal decision to stay as a people power supporter because I really love the idea of uh, being able to work with different people from different parties and um, not be restricted, you know what I mean? Because even with my own group where I work, like I faced that a, a bit of discrimination there, you know what I mean? Where you maybe are not really so valuable or, maybe okay we need you today we need you here but we don't need you here you know you cannot assign people tasks just assign people tasks like i you've got to talk to me hey what what how would you like to help out yeah. you know what i mean like and then i tell you how i want to help out and then you assign me a task in that direction not just uh you know people feel that yeah you, you're included we, we tell you to go do this and we tell you to go do that but I'm not, what would you call, call that? Someone that just kind of like runs errands. I'm not someone that runs errands, I'm a leader. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like to know exactly what my role is and stand in that lane and build something from scratch and let it become something big, right? So um, I get where she's coming from when she says that, uh, you know, th there's a lack of trust, but maybe we need to be a little bit open-minded. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because you can't just distrust anyone just because uh, they, do not, they do not belong to a political party. In fact, to be honest with you, right now in Uganda, to me personally, I, I believe we need more independent representatives. Uh, people that are neither here or there, but are 100% passionate about change and they are 100% for Uganda, the country. Because we are able to work with people from ANT, FDC, NUP. And of course, you, you have a place, you have a home. Like I'll probably say my home is with, uh, you know, Changla Nisin Robert as my leader, right? But then um, I want to be flexible. I want to have that flexibility and uh, not necessarily work as a, as a spy or be a mall. No, but be able to work 100% with uh, different people to move um, the country forward. Right. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, received a message from Stella. There is a blackout right now in, uh, mm -hmm. in her place. Uh, she sends her regards to the audience and uh, she sends her regards to you, Patricia. She's, she's been enjoying the conversation and uh, she feels uh, terrible that uh, uh, she had to uh, get kicked off. Um, uh, Henry, Stella, Stella talked about, um, 
she talked about the whole idea of uh, like a movement doesn't belong to anyone. I believe so too. You know what I mean? And that's why I am people power, Henry, because yeah. as people power, you can't kick me out of anything. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Because people power belongs to the people. Yeah. Uganda or whatever country that movement has started, right? So as people power, I feel like I have uh, a place, you know what I mean? And my place with the people that support the people power movement, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, political party or gender or religion, right? I, I don't want to have that restriction or for someone or for any leader to feel that, um, yeah, we, we, we don't need you. We, we can kick you. We can kick you out, bring you back and then kick you out again and bring you back. No, I don't have time for that. Yeah, so if people power belongs to the people uh, and the people belong to the movement, uh, then which kinds of people, is it male or female, uh, who should take leadership? Because I, I, I'm thinking about a movement now in, the, in South, uh, in Sudan actually, That's, uh, the, the movement that led to, 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 the, to, to the hosting of uh, uh, President uh, Bashir. I think, uh, uh, Bashir. Uh, that movement was led by a female. Uh, why hasn't Uganda uh, taken advantage of, of, of uh, strong female leaders uh, to lead uh, these kinds of movements in one way or, the, or another? Because uh, well, I remember, the, I think this week I remember you celebrated um, Sister Ali Madi's life. Uh, such a, a great organizer, someone who was very... Uh, meticulous in organizing, planning, uh, and executing some of those campaigns. Uh, we did lose her last year, uh, and you celebrated her life uh, recent last week. Why, why, why haven't we as Ugandans, why, why haven't Ugandans taken advantage of strong leaders, female leaders, uh, to lead some of these uh, potential uh, transformative campaigns? We're not thinking. We're just doing, we're getting things done, but we're not really sitting down to have a, a strategy behind um, these ideas that uh, we bring forward, you know what I mean, as, uh, as teams, you know? Um, in the, from the very beginning, that's what I wanted to see uh, within the People Power Movement. And I'm talking about FDC, uh, NUP, uh, you know, DP, a uh, and T, there has to ha be a way where we can all come together as women, like and strategize on what our role is and how we can work together. And uh, that will include independent representatives like myself that will never belong to any party. You understand, um, you know, again, it goes back to what Sela was talking about, this whole, you know, lack of trust. You know, if you don't belong to a party, then, uh, there's going to be some kind of trust, level of trust that you're not going to get. People are scared to work with you in a sense, you know what I mean? Because they think you are more. And why don't, what are we discussing that's so secretive that we are hiding this from all? Uh, we need to have the kind of meetings whereby even if NRM is part of that meeting, um, it's okay because what are we discussing that's so secretive? Well, the thing is, if you're if you're planning to host a, a dictator or some, uh, some some someone of the sort, uh, I think intelligence is very important. So, so intelligence intelligence is important, but there's also there's in order uh, for us to like let's say when you when you think about women leadership and when you think about planning when you think about ousting a dictator, just little things like. Uh, Sweeping roads and cleaning the uh, the what the markets. Yes, all how, how strategic? How, how how strategic do you think it would uh, would it be? Depend uh, your uh, planning conversations uh, conversations that you have in the night at two a.m. Uh, with people who are going to just go back to to, to the camps that you are competing with. Oh, no, oh, is, your strategies. Okay, you see that you talk about the camps. Let's let's take NRM out of the picture. Let's talk about FDC, ANT, DP. Why are we competing? 
at this particular moment when we're trying to try to oust Museveni, that's why I'm an independent representative. What the heck are we competing about? There should be no competition at this particular moment within these parties. They have failed to take Museveni out for how many years? 35 years. Right. Maybe part of the problem is because we are competing against one another. Well, can that- we stop competing so that we can start working together, oust Museveni and go back to competing? Can we do that? That's we could have done that, we could have done that do, uh, during the people power movement. But okay. once the people power movement became, became structured and, and it became a party, uh, then there had to be competition because when, when, there, when there's different parties, there has to be competition. You, you talked about that. learning a, about I don't get that. power, power, power uh, it, it must be uh, contested. And when you contest for power, uh, it, it, it's a matter of, uh, looking who, to who is who, who has more advantage how do i influence more right? hand- and you cannot influence unless you have uh, uh, the the liquidist power pretty much where has that got us mm-hmm. where has that got us yeah but the thing is uh, that pro, uh, kind of like contributed to uh, the lack of unity in uganda isn't it because we're competing with one another that yeah. we that's the, reason. That's the reason why we haven't yet hosted. So, so guess what? Let's stop competing. Let's stop competing and start working together. But how do we start that when we are leaving female leaders behind? Because the, 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 the point is to include more female leaders. Well, the female leaders are competing too. That's the problem. That is part of the problem. So, you know, um, for this dialogue to like really be effective, maybe we need to backtrack and start with the women and how we helping one another. You know, uh, if, if, Narukwa, uh, if Na- Nalukwa was running for uh, a post at Makere University and um, someone calls me to give her support and I refuse as a woman, what kind of woman am I? Why am I refusing to help her? If Patricia Sewungu is doing something, uh, Patricia Sewungu went and um, she stayed at the European embassy for days, for days, all the women should have supported her. Why not? Why not? You understand? So this, we, we as women have to learn how to work together first before we expect the men to see us as a force and also want to lend their support. And I think that at the moment, I don't think the women are necessarily doing a great job working together. Yeah, you, you talked about uh, endorsing a uh, candidate. For example, uh, Judith Nalukwago is running for, for the good president of Makere University. Uh, mm-hmm. When I look at right now, uh, at most of uh, our endorsements, the majority of her endorsers are male. Uh, where are the women? There are so many different influential women, uh, both w- within Uganda and the diaspora. But how come you are very few women? There's very few of you who have endorsed her. What, what does that say about uh, unity and uh, uh, what does she need to do differently as a candidate to, 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 to ensure that she gets all those uh, other influen- influential female endorsements? Well, she, she's a woman. And knowing that she's a woman, uh, you know, the, you, you go to the women. <laughs> You yourself have to, has to go to the women first. You know what I mean? And you have to reach out to the women. I would like to see... Uh, uh, well, right now it's too late in uh, the game to like try to backtrack and see who, who else she could have worked with. But I would have loved to see her work with uh, uh, Zuleika Nalukenge. Zuleika Nalukenge to me is one of the strongest women in Uganda and in people power. For me particularly, I really feel that this woman is so strong. I mean, she was kidnapped, abused, three days, no one knew where she was. She came out of it scared to even touch anything red. And then now she's wearing red. She was able to talk about her ordeal in uh, the documentary that I made, uh, United Front, Uganda Struggle for Democracy, wearing her her people power hat, wearing a red jacket, and really talk about everything that happened to her. Unashamed and unscared. You understand? So it's like, um, you want to run for, uh, you know, president of Makere University? It would be important to... um, Call, call on these uh, different women. And I really believe that there's um, women that are supporting her from the grassroots uh, that maybe have no influence when it comes to how other people view them. 
And uh, she needs to just kind of like, I'm not so sure whether she is or not, that you have to appreciate all support. When I go to Nalukwago's page, I see uh, the different people that have endorsed her, uh, the people with the name, Patricia Sewongo, uh, Sauda. Sauda uh, is there, actually. Uh, oh, that again? She's not there. That was there. But well, she, did, she definitely did endorse her. I saw that. And then uh, there's Selecta Devi, and there is uh, the musician uh, Aziz Azion. Uh, to me, I think that you're being selective and you can't be selective. Any support is good support, no matter who it comes from. Right. And when you, the person on, from the grassroots on the bottom is actually the one who helps you get the ear of the person on top. And so when you ignore the people on the grassroots, then uh, you know, eventually, no matter whether you win a post or not, you will lose uh, support long term. Well, uh, I think uh, she, it's unfortunate that she's not here to respond to that, but uh, uh, she will probably have a chance to have a look at the video and then uh, respond uh, uh, appropriately. And some of these things we do, I'm not even realizing, by the way. Like, yeah. You know, some of them are in our DNA. It's the way we've been doing things for years. You know what I mean? But uh, to me, I, I believe in uh, supporting anyone and everyone that, start, that stands for change and has good intentions and is uh, passionate about what it is that uh, they're doing. Are you, are you optimistic uh, that uh, the future Uganda, the new Uganda as it has been, uh, commonly categorized lately, uh, are you optimistic that there's going to be more initiatives for uh, female leaders uh, to take charge uh, of uh, the different uh, mm -hmm. political entities or even corporate uh, organizations? Uh, 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 and if so, how will that be realized uh, when it's also a struggle in the US? Because for the, for the first time in, in US history, we have uh, a female vice president. Uh, and uh, watching uh, President Joe Biden give his first nation, uh, nation of state address and having two ladies behind him, the speaker of the, the, the house and uh, the vice president, that, that, that's a picture that we have never seen in the history of the United States. Uh, are we ever going to get to that stage in Uganda? The truth of the matter is, the only way that's going to happen is if we, the women, push for it. Men are not going to do it for us, and they're not interested in uh, really getting us on the forefront. So we, the women, have to take the reins, and that's what I was saying, that we have to create these different pockets and uh, start working together uh, and push for this. If we don't push for this, no, it will not happen. Because Uganda is already in its infancy. Museveni is still in the state house. Political parties are still competing with one another. They don't even realize that they need women on the forefront. And let me tell you something, that is what, that's why we are where we are right now. Women are natural organizers. We are mothers of creation. When you look at all the human beings that have been born on this earth, we give back to them. You understand? And we raise them. Don't you think that we can manage parliament? Don't you think that we can manage the state house? Of course we can. Of course we can. And the men know we can. But maybe somehow, some way, the, in, in one sense, men think we can't do it. In another sense, uh, the ones that know we can do it are probably scared of our power to lead. And there's a competition there. So it's like, well, they would rather keep you down, yeah. than have you uh, become something and contribute towards your country. And so, yes, the, the women would have to push for it. The women will have to push, push for it. it. Uh, so I guess now the next question is, as, because there, there's a lot of talk about the inauguration because you're in May now. Uh, of course, there's a, a supposedly, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, in two inaugurations that are happening, one one is for uh, for, uh, for for uh, President Museveni, the other one is for President Chagulai. 
uh, I don't know how they are going to happen. I don't know who the, the uh, uh, how's, how that is going to be uh, managed. Uh, but uh, do you think, especially now, uh, now that we are in the COVID scourge, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk that the Indian variant uh, has become rampant uh, in Uganda. Uh, I'm just wondering if uh, that rhetoric about the, the Indian variant becoming uh, very uh, serious in Uganda now is a security strategy to keep people off the streets and uh, uh, disrupt the, 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 the dissenting inauguration? Or uh, what do you think about those dynamics? I mean, we know Museveni tricks. Museveni has been playing these tricks for like literally for as long as he's been in power. And um, we, the people have to get smart and uh, we have to start being defiant whereby you just kind of pretend you didn't hear it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know it's there, you know, but you, you just all pretend you didn't hear it. But, um, but again, like, uh, when you think about anything that we can do to counter what Museven is doing, just know, Henry, that it involves men and women. It involves men and women. Uh, in every struggle that we have seen worldwide, uh, the men go on the forefront and they, they fight. And not far from them are the women ready to give them aid should they be shut out you understand yeah. And yeah. So we cannot really underestimate what women can do for this movement look at uh someone like joy joy strong yeah. joy strong's like Kanalu kenge uh you have doreen uh nanjiru i believe from uh fdc dr stella nyanzi i mean the women are there they're there and they they have the power to um mobilize, uh, you know, uh, Nalukwago, you know what I mean? These women have the power to mobilize, but the thing is we, we really have to give them that power to lead, let them hold real positions and let them lead, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. go on. Uganda's, uh, Uganda's context is very complicated. So in, in most cases, when female leaders come up, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and here I'm talking about uh, uh, strong leaders like uh, uh, you mentioned Doreen Nyanjura, uh, who is the, 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 the vice mayor uh, for Kampala City Council or the deputy mayor uh, for Kampala City Council. There's uh, uh, young female leaders who have come up uh, like um, Winnie Kiza. Winnie Kiza is still very young, still very strong. Uh, she has stepped aside and uh, she gave us the reason why she was stepping aside. Uh, do you think men need to pick a leaf from uh, women like uh, Kiza? And uh, should we be content that Kiza has now stepped aside? Because she's, she's one of the, the, the strongest female leaders in Uganda, even though she has stepped aside. Uh, and what, what do other female leaders like uh, Honorable Betty Nambose, what do they need to do? Uh, to encourage more uh, or to build more of their kinds? So, um, we, we see leaders of the caliber of uh, Bettina Mbose, Winnie Kiza, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to talk about something that I'm not 100% sure of, but I think overall, the what I see we can do is um, we need to, um, leaders of that caliber, need to start mentoring the grassroots. And I would like to see someone like Winnie Kiza standing next to, um, you know, all these different leaders you've mentioned, and then all these other ones in the grassroots, like, uh, like let's say, Joy Strong, Zleika like Nalukenge. Like, th there is this uh, separation we have going on in Uganda, whereby um, FDC is over there in its corner, 
and ANT is in its corner. So Trisha Namialos cannot stand alongside Kakwenza. You know, I cannot stand alongside Doreen or if they see me with Doreen or endorsing someone like Arias Lukwago, then I cannot be trusted. And that talk is actually going on in uh, within People Power, whereby, um, no, we, we really can't trust Patricia because uh, she, she supports Arias Lukwago. She supports FDC. That's childish because I don't want to be in prison. If I have to only stand here and only support this, then I'm a prisoner. So with all this, these are uh, young kids that Museveni kidnapped and is holding hostage. And then we, the people that are free, will also become hostages in parties or in our groups. That's very silly. We need to learn to work together. And what do we do, what do, we do to ensure that? Because I, I believe that if all opposition uh, forces in, in Uganda uh, decided to come together and demanded, spoke in one voice and demanded that the people who are incarcerated in uh, Kitalia uh, be released uh, with immediate effect, uh, the government of Uganda might be forced to listen. Of course they will. Of course they will. But guess what? We are competing. Remember, we're competing. So if we are competing, do the other leaders really want the NUP, NUP uh, prisoners to be free? Do they? Because should they be freed, then uh, we see more of uh, Bobby Wayne's power. We see more of that power within the people power movement. These were the mobilizers that are arrested. And once they get out, there's going to be this amazing excitement among the supporters. Now we are seeing, uh, they're seeing more hope. Oh, you know, we, we can do this. Let's get back and re re reorganize ourselves and let's keep moving. You understand what I mean? So, and the question is, do they really want them released, Henry? Do they? Because if they did, they would be advocating for them to be released. Are they advocating for them to be released? Well, the thing is, uh, don't you think it's also the responsibility uh, of the leaders who are influential right now, uh, i.e. Uh, Bobby Wine uh, and uh, uh, the leaders of the, the National Unity Platform to reach out to other influential voices like Dr. Kizabe CJ? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and other uh, influential political leaders in Uganda and stand together. Uh, now that the campaign is, uh, the election uh, season is uh, behind us and try to focus on the future, starting with ensuring that every single uh, political prisoner is set free uh, by the government uh, in place. Oh. Legitimate or illegitimate, that's another question. Uh, what do we need to do as the people who are influencing the political dynamics of Uganda right now to ensure that we keep the government accountable? Because as far as uh, I'm concerned, there's no accountability. The government of Uganda has no accountability. It is not, uh, uh, it's not accountable to the parliament. It's not accountable to the courts of law. Uh, and most recently, uh, we had Mr. Museven say that he could bypass parliament uh, because he, apparently it has no power whatsoever. Whatever he wants. The truth of the matter is he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah, but like, how, how do we stop that when we are also uh, having uh, infightings uh, within the, the various mm -hmm. political uh, parties, uh, opposition political forces? So Henry, the truth of the matter is of course, uh, yes, uh, you know, the leaders within NUP should obviously reach out to uh, these uh, different groups. Have they, have they not? I'm pretty sure they have at, in one way or another. We saw so many pictures of Bobby Wine with uh, Mugesha Montu. We saw pictures of Bobby Wine with Dr. Kiza Bessinger. We saw him having meetings with uh, Nobat Mao. Prior to elections, we saw um, them uh, come together and say, we are going to protect the vote together. When you say you're going to protect the vote together, it's not just that. That means even the people that were at the polling stations, currently these people have been incarcerated. Some of them have died and some of them are missing. Some of them have fled the country. And I'm pretty sure you know someone from each one of those calibers that I've mentioned, right? So um, Mugesha Muntu ran for presidency. Uh, Doctor uh, uh, From the FDC camp, we had POA. And I believe POA has been uh, supportive, not so sure. I think he has. And then um, obviously we have uh, Nobat Mao and uh, Tumkonde, right? 
So if they ran for president, that means they wanted to uh, safeguard the security of all Ugandans, part of whom are actually incarcerated now as I speak. Yeah, most of, unfortunately, most of these uh, people who ran for president are all silent. They, 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 they seem to have uh, uh, soaked everything under the, the, the... So my question is then, then who are they going to lead? Who are they going to lead if they cannot even advocate for the release of the new prisoners? Then who are you planning on to, to lead? Because clearly if you became president, then you would have to lead the new uh, supporters too. Yeah, well, so, so, so what challenge are you putting to these uh, political leaders who are, who are very quiet right now, including uh, 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 Mr. Henry, uh, General Henry Tumukunde, General Mugisha Muntu, uh, Katumba, Katumba, if, uh, whether he was serious or not, uh, um, uh, and all these are other leaders that, that, that run for president. Why are they quiet? Where are they? Why can't they talk about uh, the, 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 the people who have been incarcerated. Uh, and why, are, why aren't they advocating for them to get out? Are they um, waiting for them to, to no. come so that they, they can come back and uh, tell people that they can lead? How should we keep those people accountable? Uh, we need to start having this dialogue and we have to be honest about it not just kind of like you know walk on eggshells or like not say this and not say that the truth of the matter is they're quiet and uh i mean what excuse can you give as someone that ran for our presidency to say why you're not advocating for all political prisoners like i i uh, belong to people power but i work for all of uganda and i remember being reached out when uh someone from uh tumkunde's camp got arrested and that's um, BMC, I forgot his, uh, his uh, first name, but, um, and obviously I right away, I reached out to his wife, I supported them, um, Aaron Kizer represented them. And um, the gentleman was actually just released recently. And last week he did send a message to say, thank you, you understand? And again, goes back to that um, conversation that Stella Nyanzi was having where there's this, mistrust when it comes to people that don't belong to parties. Let me tell you guys, when we don't belong to parties, I believe we there's so much people that don't belong to parties can do for Uganda. If you belong to NUP and someone from Tumukunde's party gets uh, arrested, um, and there's so many people with NUP that are being inca uh, arrested, incarcerated, are in hospitals and everything, will you help that person? Chances are you will not. And that's where independent representatives come in. Whatever case you get in front of you is the one you take care of. Why would I ask we, who's, which party this person belongs to? Why would I ask that? The person has been incarcerated. They are political prisoner. You're going to help them regardless. And I would like to see leaders do the same thing. But in order for them to do that, uh, Henry, we have to start having these dialogues among us and we have to be 100% honest about what's being done and what's not being done. And uh, we, we kind of need to, if, if Tumkunde posts something that's, uh, that's positive, I should share it on my page, why not? And what, cause there's a lot of people that don't even know the last thing Tumkunde posted. I don't even know what the last thing Tumkunde posted. You understand? It's because they're so quiet, but maybe if we can start supporting them slowly by slowly and, go to their page when they post and call them out. Hey, what do you think about the new prisoners? Why are you not advocating for them? Once we start doing that and we do it in numbers, they'll be forced to come out and do something about it. And maybe what uh, Noop needs to do is hold uh, a press conference or um, a meeting that's live and actually, um, you know, number one, you have to send a letter to them and invite them to this event. And I don't know why we're not doing that. And I don't know why uh, people like, uh, you know, Nobat Mao, FDC candidate and not, if People Power has a meeting, I think anyone should be able to go and be part of it if it's a public meeting, because it's being live streamed. There's nothing like, uh, it's, this is not a, an organization meeting. Go and show your support. Why not? Right. So um, we we it would be nice to see people call, write a letter to all these different leaders that were presidential candidates 
asking for their support and invite them to Magere or invite them to Kamocha to be part of um, uh, something where they can all speak to the public about the fact that what's taking place in Uganda is wrong. The more we start seeing these leaders together, then we, the people, will be more inclined to say, okay, well, there's unity. So I'm willing to be supportive of Mugisha Muntu, Nobat Mao, Tumukunde, uh, Dr. Kiza Besinje, Poa. You understand what I mean? It's, it has to start somewhere. And, uh, and I think it, it really needs to be public. These little private talks they're having, uh, we don't know what they talk about. And obviously, from the looks of it, they're not yielding any results. But as we can see, uh, Changoni Center Muraba, President elect, uh, did write letters to all these different leaders, whereby he wants to start having talks with them to talk about the way forward. But do you, do you think the media has played, is there, which role has the media played in uniting the opposition forces of change in Uganda? Has it played any, any role or uh, do you think the media is uh, partly compromised? And if it is, uh, what do we do then? Uh, how, how do we proceed from that uh, dilemma? Obviously, the media is compromised. Obviously, uh, there's no way you can have a dictator without um, with a media that's not compromised. They're compromised. But then um, uh, what uh, NUP did, uh, people power was come on the, uh, you know, come to the forefront and they started creating uh, ways to uh, live stream their own uh, press, press conferences or live stream their meetings at Magere or Kamocha. So honestly speaking, at this point, we can't even blame the media anymore. There's social media, there's Facebook, there's Twitter. I see people like Patricia Sewungu and uh, Pfizer, uh, Karim Muntambi, they are having meetings on a nightly basis, calling up to senators. And then obviously, then the bloggers come in by having these uh, Twitter protests, you understand? And then obviously we have, um, we also have, uh, you know, again, bloggers like uh, Patricia Sewungu, Pfizer, uh, Lumbuye, Kimbugwe, that can now go on, uh, on Facebook Lives and YouTube and uh, Lord knows where else and that Zoom and actually um, move the message forward. Like Lumbuye ha has a, a platform where he's being watched by over 10,000 people at the same time. You know what I mean? So we cannot, we cannot say at this particular moment, I think media is doing what they're doing. It is what it is. But the question is, do we know about the people that are pro-change uh, that are writing the good articles? Uh, about uh, the, the movement? Do we know where they're posting these articles? We don't even know. How many people are supporting the Observer in Uganda? How many? We're not really supporting the Observer, that's the truth. So um, how many people are supporting uh, Jimmy Spears St. Tongo? He you know, draws his cartoons and stuff, you know, and uh, his cartoons are pro-change. He's calling out the government on uh, the things that they're doing wrong, but how many of us are supporting him? How many of us are elevating him? You know, Kakwenza wrote a book about uh, his torture. He wrote The Greedy Barbarians, calling out Museveni on his crap. How many of us bought the book? How many of us know Kakwenza? How many of us support Kakwenza? When you go to Kakwenza's page, it's more like, um, Kakwenza doesn't like NUP, I and mean, then, uh, oh, in Noop, we're like, well, he doesn't support us. You understand what I mean? So. There's so much we have that brings us together, but I feel like... Um, do, do you think uh, leaders within the particular different uh, entities, political entities, or specifically the opposition political entities, do you think they have a responsibility to sensitize their supporters uh, to be yes. um, mindful or respectful of other people's views? Specifically, uh, I'm talking about NUP here and uh, how, the, the, uh, how the Red Army uh, interacts with other opposition uh, uh, entities uh, on social media. What, what role should leaders play in sensitizing or uh, ensuring that their respective uh, demographics mm -hmm. are respectful of each other's views even, even when they are in opposition of each other? Well, um, 
weakness or a strength? Do, do, do you think that's a weakness or a strength? Do you think uh, that, 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 that makes us a, a bit of uh, political, a bit of political players or uh, what does that make us? Uh, and and, and uh, to what extent does it advantage the incumbent? I mean, I feel like those, those are the things that continue to divide us, you know, and, you know, those are the things that really make political parties look very undesirable to people like myself, you know what I mean? Because we want to see a free Uganda and we know that um, if we do not come together and learn how to work together, we're not going to see that. And so, yes, I believe that uh, when, you know, the members are misbehaving, leaders should come out and uh, should set them straight and uh, say, you know, what you're doing is wrong and this is the reason why. And then of course, there is uh, times when uh, leaders within these different parties are also misbehaving. And the question is, uh, should the NOOP supporters just keep quiet and just take the abuse? Right. No, they have to say something. You understand? So it's like, it's, you have to be careful as a leader you know, you, you want to say something about it, but then at the same time, you have to also listen to the leaders, what, your, your members, what are they saying? So, for example, if I post about uh, FDC or I post about Mugisha Mutu, uh, positively, I get comments like, why do you support them? They don't support us. You know, right. and they're saying, well, we have all these political prisoners what are they saying about these political prisoners? When was the last time they posted someone that was, uh, let's say, kidnapped or raped or, um, you know, died? When was the last time they showed up to a funeral of a noob supporter? You understand what I mean? And yeah. the, the truth of the matter, Henry, is it's valid. What they're saying is valid. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so then at what point does a leader come out and say what you're doing is wrong? I think leaders need to check themselves. And to be honest with you, um, I don't even know why um, a leader within any party would even be at all affected or upset at uh, what um, you know, uh, members are doing, no matter which party they belong to. The reason why you want to stand for presidency is because you have the ability to lead a country. You understand? So once you see people complaining or abusing you for one reason or another, have a meeting, talk about it. And be honest about, about um, in this meeting, why are they abusing us? Yeah. And then someone is gonna come up and say, well, well, it's, it's competition, you know? And then someone else is, if I'm there, I'm gonna come out and say, well, have you supported <laughs> noob supporters that are, you know, incarcerated? The yeah. answer is no. So then we're going to say, well, what, why don't we start off by supporting them? Or maybe just simply sharing Bobby Wine's post. When he posts as a leader, share that post. Talk to Bobby Wine. Tell him to tag you in this post, in specific posts that deal with, uh, you know, Ugandans being uh, kidnapped. Why, why do we want to say noob supporters? No, they are Ugandans. Ugandans are being kidnapped. Ugandans are being killed, right? So once these leaders start doing that, the abuse is going to subside. Right. You know, it's like it shouldn't just be... Bobby Wine saying, uh, stop doing A, B, C, D, and E. No, it's like, we need to look at it from both angles. You know, what, what are they doing wrong that, uh, you know, NUP members uh, seem to be a little bit indifferent about what they're doing and, and what they're not doing. Right. Well, uh, we are about to wrap up this conversation, but, uh, this conversation, but before we wrap up, I'm going to share a, a, a video from, uh, uh, Judith Nelukwago, who was unable to be with us here today, uh, and then you're going to give your final remarks, and then we shall wrap up this conversation. Fellow Macarians, my name is Judith Nalukwago, the 86th Guild President, Macquarie University. Ever since we declared our intentions to run for the Guild Presidents of this university, we have faced enormous resistance from the university administration, the security apparatus, and above all, the cabal that has captured Macquarie University for over a decade and is trying to take grip of it. It is very sad that some members of the administration 
and some students have knowingly or unknowingly accepted to participate in this witch hunt against us and ultimately against the students' courts. Gallant students, we have for the past few weeks been promising that we shall fight for you. We have made our commitment and we shall defend you. The administration knows that and they know that we mean it. They know that we shall keep our promise. That is why they are fighting us. They know clearly that a woman called Judith Nalukwa can never be bought off, compromised, or even intimidated. This is why their only strategy is making sure we are off the ballot. The rules of this election were set by the University Council, and according to those rules, were verified and re-verified. Unlike other candidates, our academic standing has been cross-checked for over eight times, and every single one of them we are still found qualifying. Those shameless individuals took their own rules and decided to interpret them in the most illegal way with a single intention of twisting them to eliminate us. We had the option of crying and letting everything pass. However, the words of our president kept ringing in our heads. Freedom comes to those who fight and not those who cry because the more you cry, the more your people continue to die. We we'll woke up and fought back. My fellow students, the good news is, I can give you my word that we shall defeat them. Disregard all propaganda. We are standing tall in this race to assert that people power is stronger than the people in power. Students will defeat the representatives of the dictator. And on the voting day, we shall show them that we are the great Mercury universe, that our own leaders are not chosen from the offices and under air conditioners of their houses. On voting day, let us stand up in big numbers and show them that from our own schools, from the ballot papers, we Macarians choose the commanders of our own struggle. I remind you, dear friends, turn up and vote Judith Nalukwago. I will lead you in this struggle to defend the alma mater. People power, our power. We are removing a dictator. Uh, your thoughts about that uh, submission from uh, Judith Nalukwago? Uh, of course, the voting is on Tuesday. Uh, she's been contesting for almost uh, two months, maybe. The campaign has gone on for almost two months. They, they have been extending and extending. And like, so it's been a long journey for her. Uh, she's the only female candidate in the race. Uh, she's facing a lot of uh, backlash uh, from... Uh, uh, the male-dominated campaigns. Uh, she was supposed to be with us here today. She wasn't able because of the different uh, uh, dynamics that are going on. She, she had another debate that overran. Uh, uh, first, she had to complete a debate with uh, the, the official debate, university debate, candidates debate, and then she had another debate uh, uh, on uh, Galaxy Radio, uh, which uh, is uh, happening right now as well. Uh, so your final thoughts on this conversation and uh, what we need to do and uh, uh, pretty much how we should uh, think about shaping the future uh, of female leadership in Uganda. Patricia. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, talk about uh, Nalu Kwago and I would like to thank you for the support that you have extended. So I would also like to thank you uh, for introducing me to her. She's a very strong um, leader and a uh, very strong woman. And she said again at the end that freedom comes to those uh, who fight. And so um, it would be nice to see a woman like herself become a guild president of uh, Macquarie University, especially uh, being that uh, she's for a change and uh, she belongs to... Um, NUP. Uh, it's a big step forward. Like we need this. Last year we um we had all these men. I don't think we had a woman. Did we have a woman? No. No. You know. So this is our opportunity to uh, support the women, and it's so nice to see someone like yourself, uh, someone like uh, Roy uh, Lugu Mao. Yeah, exactly. Roy Lugu uh support her and uh, really elevate her. People like Dr. Stella Nyanzi, someone that's coming from FDC. It's so nice to also um, see her 
be uh, supportive of her and of obviously me as an independent representative. And so um, with that said, I'll move on from that uh, when it comes to uh, the subject at hand, which was, uh, you know, what can men do to, you know, help uh, women leaders? Uh, I want to kind of break that down. Uh, men should call out um, inequity. Uh, don't be bystanders when uh, you have a woman in uh, politics or in leadership that's being um, overlooked, uh, is not being respected, is um, it has been turned into uh, an errand <laughs> runner. Uh, you need to say something. Uh, do not uh, call out inequity. Do not be a bystander. Next thing, uh, it's very important that men are giving credit. Uh, to women, uh, when women come up with these amazing, amazing ideas on um, how we can change uh, Uganda or how we can change our individual parties. Uh, it's very important that men are not stealing these ideas, but are actually uh, giving credit uh, to the women, um, the woman that has come up with the idea, if it has come from a woman. And then uh, next thing is that men need to take time to listen to um women, uh, often uh, women are being dismissed uh, and uh, men get defensive when women call them out. I know I am a very, very outspoken person and I'm very fearless. And anytime I call a man out, yes, they do get defensive. <laughs> some of them don't listen. And then of course, there's some good men that actually take time and they're like, you know what, you're right. I'll, I'll do better, I'll change, whatever. And then of course, not all the time women, we are right as women. Sometimes we're wrong and we need to be dismissed. But in the case that we are right, it is very important that women, men are taking the time to uh, listen to us. And then of course, men should share homework. So you go to a meeting and women come up with all these amazing ideas. And then after the meeting, uh, back she's back to uh, getting coffee, doing this and that. No, if uh, you know, sh share the homework, give her a responsibility so that she can feel that, like she's part of the team. And lastly, for us as women, it is very important that we understand men are not going to change what's wrong with us or men are not going to, you know, go above and beyond to include us in what they are doing. They're very comfortable. They don't think they need us. <laughs> you understand what I mean? So it is very important that we are realized that, that we realize that all we got is us. So we, the women, have to come together and change uh, what's wrong with, um, with Uganda, the way Uganda is being laid, and also change the, uh, the, the way men uh, treat us. And, uh, you know, to take charge, take charge, demand for our own rights. That's how it happened in the United States. It wasn't a man that led the feminist movement. It was not a man that uh, decided that, oh, we, women need to vote. No, it was women out there holding plaques saying, we need our rights, we need to vote. And that continues on up to this day. Here in the United States, uh, women still need more rights. And so in a place like Uganda, it is time for women to come to the forefront and start fighting for their rights so that their children, who some will be women, uh, can be born in a country whereby their rights are respected as women and they are allowed to lead rather not be used as puppets. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Patricia, Comrade Patricia Namiaro. Uh, thank you very much for uh, endorsing uh, Judith Narukwago for promoting her. I've, see, I've been seeing uh, so many uh, of your posts promoting her. Uh, thank you so much for uh, elevating uh, that young lady uh, and, and her voices uh, to the world, uh, not just in within the Ugandan context, but globally. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Stella, even though she uh, uh, she, she got off the, uh, the conversation, uh, of course, because of the internet, uh, but also because of the blackout. Mm -hmm. uh, in her community at the moment. Uh, I wanna thank Judith Narukwago for offering herself. It's very tough uh, for a woman in Uganda to offer yourself to become a leader. Of course, yep. you're going to be slandered. Uh, there's going to be a lot of backlash from men because uh, just, people just don't see you as worthy or capable. Uh, uh, they always try to push you down, but uh, I wanna thank uh, that young girl 
a young lady uh, for standing up to men and uh, offering herself and going through a very gorilla link uh, campaign, uh, which I want to say has been uh, for the most part, uh, if not all, uh, successful. Uh, I wish her all the best uh, during the, 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 uh, the voting uh, period. It's going to be a, a, a dynamic hybrid uh, voting because they are going to vote both online and in person. So it's a hybrid. It's the, it's the first of its kind uh, at Makere University. Uh, we hope that it go, it's going to go well and uh, nothing is going to be uh, manipulated uh, on, on the online uh, section. Uh, we hope that the university is, is going to continue uh, living up to its reputation as one of the best universities in Africa. Uh, Makere University, the eyes are on you, uh, both the administration, but also uh, the students, the voters, the eyes are on you. Who are you going to choose to become your next guild president? Uh, the question is not for me to answer. It is for you. And that, that, that day is Tuesday. Uh, that's when you're going to answer uh, that question. Uh, keeping in mind that the last time Makere University had a female guild president was 2013, I believe. Uh, so that, that, that's over uh, uh, seven years ago. Uh, so how are you going to vote on Tuesday? Think about it, look at the different uh, dynamics and uh, uh, the manifestos that are being offered and decide how uh, you're going to uh, defend uh, your rights to, to, to decide who leads you again. Thank you so much for following us. This is the state of the nation. We have been discussing uh, women leadership in Uganda and what the role of men should be. Uh, we have tried to set uh, some of the records straight and we have suggested uh, a few uh, recommendations. How you use them, how you interpret them is up to you. Again, this is the state of the nation. Thank you so much for following us. My name is Henry Sully for the African Alliance.